Welcome back to the commonly used Excel charts and functions video series. Today in lesson seven, we will be covering scatter plots. Just as a reminder, we suggest watching each video twice, just watching through the first time and then watching and following along the second. All right, we're gonna start with a small data set today, which is ice cream sales for seven days. And we also have the temperature of each of those seven days. We wanna see if there is any correlation between temperature and ice cream cells, so let's make a scatter plot. I'm gonna highlight my data and go to the insert tab, select the scatter plot options, and then choose the first option under the scatter header. So you can see our graph is made, but it is lacking some of those important elements like a descriptive title and X and Y axis labels. So let's first edit the title that um, Excel put in there for us. I'm going to make mine ice cream sales um, at different temperatures. Remember, we have to manually add the X and Y axis labels. So I'm going to click on my graph and use that green plus sign and check off the axis titles box. In this case, my X axis is going to be degrees and I'm going to add Celsius in brackets just to make it a bit more descriptive. And then my Y axis in this case is going to be sales. So let's take a minute now and look at our graph. We have to remember the purpose of a scatter plot is to illustrate a relationship between two variables. As we can see in the scatter plot, as temperature goes up, ice cream sales go up as well. All right, now I have a new data set here, which is study hours for a final science exam and the corresponding final exam score. I've already created the scatter plot on the right hand side here, and you can see there's a generally positive correlation between the two variables. As you study more, your exam final exam score tends to be higher. Now you might be wondering when making a scatter plot, how does Excel decide which variable to put on the X axis and which variable to put on the Y axis? It follows a general rule that your first column, in this case hours, goes on your X axis and your second column, which is scores, goes on your Y axis. Let's use the same data set to make another scatter plot, but let's switch the columns to see if the scatter plot looks any different. So in this case, instead of doing hours first, we'll do scores first and then hours second. I'm just going to take a copy of my hours data here and copy it and then I'm going to paste it in the new column over here. And I'm going to do the same thing with scores, take a copy of the data and then paste it in the new column over here. All right, now I'll select all the data and go to my insert tab and select the scatter option and the first choice under the scatter header. I'm going to move the chart to the right here and then just move it up as well. So we have the same problem here. We need to change the chart title and we need to add the axis labels onto this graph. So let's use that green plus sign on the right hand side and check off the axis titles box. I'm actually just going to copy the title that I have in my first graph just into the title placeholder here. All right, so now in this case, we see scores, which is our first column, will be our x-axis label. So let's change the x-axis label to scores. Hours is our second column, which will be our y-axis. So let's change that to study hours. Now, if we take a minute here and look at both graphs, we see that both illustrate that as study hours increase, exam scores increase as well. However, the slope between the two graphs looks very different. On the left hand side, you can see that the slope looks very flat. And on the right hand side, we have a much steeper slope. So you might be wondering, which chart should we create? The general rule of thumb is to put the independent variable on the x axis and the dependent variable on the y-axis. In our specific example, study hours is the independent variable, 
and exam score is the dependent variable. If it's ever difficult for you to remember what is the independent variable and which is the dependent variable, then try to remember this. Independent variables are the cause and dependent variables are the result. So in our specific example, a student received a higher exam score, which is the dependent variable, because they spent more time studying, which is the independent variable. So in this case, the graph on the left-hand side is the correct one. All right, so I'm back again with a new, another new data set. This one is very similar to the last one we just used, which is study hours. And this time, instead of a science exam, it's a math exam score. I already have two scatterplot charts created. The one on the left-hand side here has study hours on the x-axis and score on the y-axis and the scatter plot on the right hand side here uses the exact same data except this time the axes are switched so score is on the x-axis and study hours are on the y-axis. If we take a look at both graphs and I'm actually going to zoom out just so that we can see them at the same time better there is no correlation between study hours and the final exam scores in this case. All the dots in each of the graphs don't have a pattern and are just randomly scattered. But which chart does a better job at displaying this relationship? If we look at the chart on the left, you can see that there are three dots right here that represent three students that studied less than two hours and received over 80% on their exam. If we look on the right hand side, when we try to find these three students, it's a bit difficult. Can you find them? They are actually represented by these three dots in the lower corner here. Anything that is located in the bottom corner is usually perceived as having a lower value, even though these students had one of the higher exam scores. So as a result, the chart on the right hand side becomes difficult to understand and goes against our intuition. So in this case, it is best to use the graph on the left, which reinforces our rule of putting the independent variable, which in this case is study hours, on the x-axis. This makes more sense and makes the graph easier to understand. If we go back to the first scatter plot we made, again, this reinforces that rule we just decided on. The temperature in this case is the independent variable because it caused more ice cream sales to occur, so we have it on the x-axis. However, not every data set will have an independent and dependent variable, so let's look at one of those examples. So again, I have another new data set here. This one deals with petal length and petal width for three different species of orchid or iris flowers. It's important to notice that each uh, entry in our data set here corresponds to a specific species. So our first one is Setosa, our second one is Versicolor, and the third and final species is Virginica. We'll have to input each species separately into the scatter plot, and I'll show you how to do this. This is going to seem a bit backwards, so just hold on for a second. Let's go to the Insert tab and go to the scatter options here and just select the first choice under the scatter header. Excel will just automatically input a blank rectangle for you. Right click on the blank rectangle and choose the select data option. Go to the left hand side here where it says legend entries and select the add button. For series name, we're going to make one series for each um, different species we have. So we'll have three series in total. So I'm going to select the first cell that says Setosa to name my series after the first species of iris. For my series X values, I'm going to select the entire petal length column that corresponds to Setosa species. For the series Y values, I'm going to delete the one that Excel automatically input there and I'm going to select the entire column for petal width that corresponds to the Setosa species. And then I'll press OK. So you can see our first one for Setosa is complete. 
I'm going to do the same process for the other two species we have. So I'll press add, reverse the color, and then just select that entire length column that corresponds to the matching species. All right, and then press OK. And then our last one will be for the third species. All right, so now that we have three series, one for each of our species, we can press OK here in the bottom right hand corner. And if we scroll up, we can see our scatter plot was made. So each color represents a different species. There are elements missing to this graph, so let's add them using that green plus sign. We'll need axis titles, our chart title, and then a legend this time as well, so we can understand which species represents which color. My chart title in this case will be three species of iris flowers. Um, my x-axis in this case was our first column, which was the petal length. And then my y-axis was our second column, which was the petal width. So if we take a second and look at this chart, we can see that petal length and petal width are just features of the flower. They aren't independent or dependent variables. So in this case, you can put petal length on either the x or y-axis or petal width on the x or y-axis. Let's make both and see how they work. So I already created the two scatter plot charts with the data set that we were working with just a couple moments ago. The chart on the left here is the exact same one that we just made um, because it has petal length on the x-axis and petal width on the y-axis. If we look at the chart on the right hand side, we can see that it's made from the exact same data set, except this time the axes are switched. So petal width is on the x-axis this time and petal length is on our y-axis. I'm gonna zoom out again, just so that we can see both graphs a bit easier at the same time. And if we take a look at both of them, we can see that both scatter plots look very different, but the relationship between the two variables stays the same. Now you might be wondering, which chart should you create? In this case, since there's no dependent or independent variables, either chart is acceptable. Personally, I tend to prefer the one on the left-hand side just because it looks a bit more natural. Since we plotted three species of flowers successfully on one scatter plot chart, now let's try to plot two sets of exam data on the same scatter plot. All right, so here's just a quick example of a scatter plot with two different exam score data sets plotted on one chart. You can see the blue represents science and the orange represents ELA. Just by taking a quick look at it, you can see that the ELA exam tends to be a lot easier than the science exam because it results in overall higher final exam scores. All right, now we'll move on to our last portion of today's video, which is the trend line. All right, so I've returned back to the ice cream sales data set that we began the video off with, and we're going to add a trend line onto the scatter plot that we made in the beginning of the video. To do this, just click on the chart and use that green plus sign and check off the trend line box on the bottom there. What exactly is a trend line? A trend line is a straight line that represents the relationship between two variables. Personally, I prefer not to add a trend line because it makes the chart cluttered and it can hide important insights of the data. For example, if we look at our ice cream sales data a bit closer, we can see that when the temperature is between 20 and 25 degrees, sales are fairly stable. As soon as the temperature exceeds 25 degrees, we can see that sales increase greatly. When we use the trend line, that important insight is hidden. So let's just select the trend line there and delete. I'm going to now move to the second data set that we used, which was the science exam study hours and final score. Let's add the trend line to this one, again using that green plus sign and checking off the trend line box. 
Now this trend line seems to be the better fit, but if we get rid of the trend line and look at the data a bit closer, we can see that there are three clusters of data points here. So let's delete that trend line. The first cluster is for students who studied less than six hours and their score range tends to be between 50 and 70 percent. The second cluster is for students who studied between seven and 11 hours and most of them received scores between 60 and 80 percent. The third and final cluster are for students who studied 12 hours or more and their marks are between 80 and 95 percent. If we add that trend line, the trend line blends all these clusters together and hides these important insights. So that concludes our lesson for today. We learned how to make scatter plots. We learned which values go to the x-axis, how to understand the scatter plot, and why not to add a trend line. Next lesson, we will talk about histograms, and thank you for watching.